So good evening everybody and uh, thank you all for being here. This is the first meeting of the new academic year for NIA 2023-2024. We are very proud to present uh, a volume, the 14, number 14 of our <laughs> series papers and monographs from the Norwegian Institute of Athens, edited by Professor Neil Price and uh, Dr. Uh, Marianne Hemerickson. Thank you so much for being here. Also a third editor who could not attend, uh, Dr. Uh, Carlton Janke from uh, Saxo Institute uh, at the University of Copenhagen. Before we move on, and we have uh, both some greetings from the Scandinavian directors and uh, the editors who will enlighten us about this exciting <coughs> volume, I would like to just mention a couple of things that I consider very important uh, for this event tonight. First of all, this uh, is a culmination of an idea that started uh, long ago. It started um, approximately 2015-2016 as a preliminary thought about something on the Vikings. Uh, as you know, in Greece we don't have um, Viking research, so it was um, a kind of an original idea to introduce the Vikings in the Greek context, especially the Vikings in the Mediterranean. So uh, my former colleague, Zarko Tankosits, um, uh, introduced the idea. <coughs> the then director of the institute, uh, Professor Jure Neukland, was very happy about it. And then uh, Jenny Valensin from the Swedish Institute uh, shared with enthusiasm and developed further this idea. Uh, also the Danish, uh, the then uh, director of the Danish Institute, Christina Winter Jakobsen. Uh, so it is a collaborative effort between among the three uh, Scandinavian institutes uh, in Athens. Another point of equal importance, I think, is the fact that both the conference that um, was the end result uh, of this idea in 2019, uh, organized by the three institutes, and this volume tonight are just stages in the longer process of bringing uh, the Vikings in Greece. Um, this is further supported by the proposition of um, the current director of the Viking Museum in Oslo, uh, Professor Håkon Glöster, who would like to um, start a long-term collaboration with Greece, meaning <laughs> signing a memorandum with Greek bodies, uh, cultural bodies and the Ministry of Culture probably, uh, to start a, an exchange, exhibitions, conferences, workshops, what not. Uh, we believe that that will go through and we will have more on the Viking research uh, in Greece for, uh, and, and also exchanges and networking with the uh, Greek counterparts. That is all for me. Uh, before I move to um, give the floor to Zarko, uh, Zarko Tankotic, we will um, uh, speak a little bit more about this uh, exciting idea. I'd like to say many thanks to the directors, Yemi, Wallenstein, uh, Christina is not with us um, this evening, but Mons Pelt, the current director of the Danish Institute, will also uh, greet us uh, a little bit later on. And um, Angelos Angiropoulos, our book printer. Angelos is always very willing and very flexible to accommodate everything that we ask. Thank you so much. Um, I would also like to thank Pascalis, uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Pascalis Afiriades, who attended meticulously the process of this publication. And of course, last but not least, to welcome tonight our director and founder of the Norwegian Institute, Professor Olvin Andersen. Mm -hmm. It's a pleasure and an honor that you are with us tonight. We are very, very moved by that. Thank you. So. Um, that's all for me. Thank you so much for attending this event. Um, follow us on Facebook and the other social media. We have a lot of activity during the fall. And now the floor is to Zarko. Um, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I hope you can hear me. <laughs> Uh, even uh, at a distance like this, 
it is great, absolutely amazing to see this uh, this project come to fruition in such a way. And this has been a long-awaited book, and I'm so happy to see it uh, finally finished. Uh, of course, this has been, as Dana mentioned, the work uh, in progress for a pretty long time. Uh, for me personally, it started in uh, 2014, actually. Um, when I was at the uh, European Archaeological Association meeting, EAA, at the uh, Istanbul, and uh, I, uh, while visiting the Hagia uh, Sophia um, church, I saw the small uh, runic inscription uh, in the church, and this is what gave me the idea that this uh, connection between the Nordic countries and the Mediterranean is something uh, worth exploring further. Now, I wish I could say that it was a single process, of course it wasn't, because from 2014 to the realization of the conference, uh, it was five years, uh, we uh, tried to uh, test the waters by inviting several uh, scholars that work on Nordic archaeology uh, to uh, present their research in Athens, and uh, we have encountered overwhelming uh, support and interest for this, uh, with a lot of people attending, both professional and from the general public. So uh, it was clear that there is interest uh, for this kind of topic to uh, to be brought to Athens uh, and presented to the Greek public, professional and uh, non-professional. Uh, the main aim uh, behind this uh, entire effort uh, was to, of course, first of all, connect the two called the scholarly communities, the research communities that are usually not in uh, such a close contact with each other. And it's very often also uh, the Nordic institutes in Athens to present the research communities from uh, the Nordic countries, especially in this case from Norway, uh, Sweden, and Denmark. There's very, very little communication between uh, people, colleagues working on Nordic uh, past, whether it's in terms of archaeology or history or uh, medieval literature and their counterparts here in uh, or there in the Mediterranean. So this was the overarching aim of the conference and of course it's good, uh, the idea was good to connect the, uh, the those two communities in terms of uh, showing uh, the research that uh, the Nordic Institute is doing in Athens and bring them uh, onto the uh, map of researchers that are mostly connected to work in the Nordic countries. Uh, this was uh, picked up by uh, the then director, as they have said, of uh, the Norwegian Institute, uh, Professor Ockman, who was kind enough to uh, contact uh, the other Nordic Institutes, and we realized that we share the same vision. And I have to say that you know I was very happy to hear that, and we proceeded in a very, in my opinion, seamless collaboration, in a very enjoyable collaboration with the organization of the conference uh, that took place in Athens in. Uh, 2019, and you know those of you who know me uh, will understand that I don't know much about Viking uh, archaeology or general past, uh, but probably because of that, this was one of the most enjoyable conference experiences of my life. I thoroughly enjoyed all the lectures, and I'm very happy to see uh, those lectures and those presentations uh, finding their way into this uh, kind of publication that's going to be available for a much broader audience than the conference was. Uh, itself. So, uh, once again, uh, even for me, I look forward to the presentation and thank you all, especially my colleagues there in the first row that I can see on the collaboration on the conference and uh, and all the work that will come out of the conference and the publication hopefully in the future. Thank you. Brief. I would just like to say on behalf of the Swedish Institute of Athens, congratulations to the editors and of course to the Norwegian Institute uh, for what I believe is so unique and truly important volume. Uh, it firmly places the Vikings here in southern places where we're not used to encounter them or thinking about them, but also uh, through tales and objects brought home to Viking homeland, if we can call it something like that, 
uh, it traces the early Nordic awareness of the Mediterranean world and its legacy. Uh, and I think that the book will be an eye-opener for many, uh, possibly uh, that it will have an impact on the, in a very classical archaeolo archaeological way, and that is um, we're not, uh, not aware of, a, of an object's existence or a category of object, you tend not to find them in excavations. And once you have identified them, they tend to pop up uh, here and there. And uh, I believe, at least I hope, that this will be the case with Viking presence, Viking associations of different sorts in the Mediterranean. Uh, as uh, I, I can only agree with Sarah, it was a real pleasure to organize this conference uh, with the other Scandinavian Institute, with uh, the Surprise uh, Project. Uh, really, it couldn't have been a better collaboration. And at the time, we hoped for a continuation. Uh, and I think that the book shows many threads, perhaps even silk threads, that we could pick up in these terms. And uh, I hope uh, that we will meet you for the future. Thank you very much. And again, congratulations. We have a very short uh, greeting from the director of the Danish Institute, Dr. Mons Bell, uh, who could not be with us tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends and dear colleagues, I would like first to extend my thanks to all of you for coming here. It is certainly an honor to appear before you here today in celebrating this new publication on Vikings. And this is not least so because of its topic, Vikings in the Mediterranean. When we think about Vikings, our minds often gravitate towards their explorations in the North Atlantic, to the settlements in Iceland and Greenland, or to a raid in the British Isles. And yet, their adventures did not stop there. The Mediterranean was not beyond their reach, and this is precisely why I feel elated today, because we are in a position to celebrate this overlooked chapter in the Viking history. Vikings in the Mediterranean is not just a testament to the far-reaching ambition of these Northmen, but it also stands as a symbol of the shared historical threats between Scandinavia and Greece. Just as the Vikings ventured here, bringing with them their customs and tales and interactions, other instances have bridged our two regions. Consider, for example, the trade routes that connected the Baltic Sea to the Byzantine Empire, facilitating the exchange of goods and cultures. Think about the Iranian guard and the lead unit of the Byzantine army, composed primarily of Norsemen. The presence of Constantinople is a vivid reminder of the intermingling of our history. The fact that Vikings ventured into the Mediterranean signifies a blending of two historically rich regions. <laughs> it reminds us that the tapestry of history is not just home of individual threats, but also is a complex and intricate design of interlaced stories and shared experiences. This Viking ex uh, presence in the Mediterranean is not only an expeditionary tale, but it is also symbolic of the shared narratives and cultural exchanges that have been a part of our joint history. This publication, therefore, is more than just an academic endeavor. It indeed is so, and an important one, but it is also a celebration of interconnectedness, and I'm truly glad 
that they can bring these historical connections from Scandinavia to Greece, shedding light on mutual influences and shared journeys. But the Viking journeys are just one chapter in the sheer Scandinavian Greek legacy. Think of the trade networks which have been the lifeblood of civilizations connecting the north with the south, neighboring exchange of goods and ideas and philosophies. Consider our myths, tales of gods and heroes and monsters that while distinct, distinct in their details, echo similar values, fears and aspirations of our peoples. By studying and understanding these serious episodes, we aren't merely dwelling into the past. We are cultivating a richer present and a more collaborative future. And this is why, this is the way, and this is why this publication also reaffirms our commitment to fostering and strengthening the bonds between Scandinavia and Greece, in academia, in culture, and beyond. I'm profoundly heartened to see this approach to history, an approach that emphasizes shared journeys and mutual influences. It is an approach that we wish to continue and expand upon. In conclusion, I hope this gathering serves as an inspiration, as a reminder that history is not just about separate narratives, but about connections, encounters, and share stories that have shaped us and let us look forward to more collaboration, more discoveries. Thank you very much. So now it's time to welcome Professor Price, uh, who will uh, present the academic content and merit of this volume. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, good evening, everyone. It's uh, such a pleasure to be back in Athens. Uh, I want to begin just by um, thanking everyone at the three Nordic Institutes, the directors, past and present, and all their staff for the amazing support that we've had in this project. Um, it really has been a, 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 a much smoother ride than one could have imagined. Um, and also, not least, um, thank you for, for bringing myself and, and Marianne here this evening. When we, uh, when we started this, uh, the question that we most often received was, why have a conference, and later a book, on the Vikings and the Mediterranean? And I think the simplest answer to that was in order that in the future that would not be a natural question to ask. <laughs> Is that simple? To some degree, the, the, the Eastern Mediterranean is a familiar part of the Viking world, um, or at least its northern extension, which I, I don't think most of us would regard as the Mediterranean at all, the Black Sea. This is Byzantium, Constantinople, modern Istanbul, the Byzantine Empire. And this is, of course, and several people have mentioned it already, this is the world of the Varangians, the, the, the guard and the mercenaries from Scandinavia who later formed a, a greater and greater part of the Byzantine armies. But we really have to remember, I think, that Greece is just as much a part of that empire. So much so that even in law, in Viking and Scandinavia, service with those Byzantine armies, service in the Varangian Guard, was not described as going to Mikliadi, so their word for Constantinople. It was described as going to Greece, Greek land. Something that we need to remember. There is absolutely a Greek Viking Age, and I can only agree with Yeni that um, the more we look for it, I really do think there's going to be a lot to find. So our first emphasis in the book was on where we are now. Um, it's not just the presence of the Nordic Institutes, this, this is a natural place to have that conference and from which to, to base the, the resulting volume. And our first, our first emphasis there is very much on, the, on this Greek Viking age. 
But it's not just this part of the Mediterranean that's been neglected. It's also the west of the Mediterranean. Um, the, uh, the, the emirate of Al-Andalus, um, modern southern Spain and Portugal, um, a, a, a very powerful player in the Viking Age. Um, and also the southern shore of the Mediterranean, essentially the, the extensions of the Abbasid Caliphate and its satellites. Um, so essentially a, a North African Viking Age. This really is a, a seriously understudied area. And although there have been one or two works in recent years, um, this conference uh, for the whole of Mediterranean really is the first attempt to try and get a kind of holistic picture of that region. So I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that despite how famous or notorious, depending on your point of view, that the, the Vikings are, with all their misconceptions and stereotypes and <coughs> cliches and so on, um, there are still parts of the Viking diaspora, for want of a better word, that really haven't been studied very well. Um, and this is absolutely one of them. The Vikings in the Mediterranean really is a new frontier in Viking studies. Just to give you some examples that are in the book, and Marielle knows is going to be talking more about the, the actual structure of the book so you can get an idea of its contents, but the kinds of things that come into this. Um, for example, the, the first Viking raids to enter the Mediterranean from the west. Um, not very many of them, but very, very vivid stories that have come to us minimally in the archaeology, but through the written records of a whole succession of different cultures, from Francia, what is now essentially France, um, through to the Christian kingdoms of northern Iberia, to Al-Andalus in Spain, um, even in North Africa, and um, on into uh, the Byzantine world, and even um, the, the records of the Middle East, following these Viking expeditions as they move through these different sort of ethnic environments. The first one we know about is from 844, um, fairly early in the Viking Age. Uh, what seems to be an attempt to, to really seriously attack the, the Arab Emirates. Um, they plunder in Galicia and along the Portuguese coast, and it all goes totally pear-shaped in Seville, in total disaster when their fleet is essentially destroyed. Um, and it's not for, for well over 10 years that they come back. But there is, um, at this date, a truly remarkable and I think, I think unique consequence of that 844 raid. Because in 845, diplomatic relations, not something we think about in connection with the Vikings, uh, opened up between the Arab Emirates in Al-Andalus and what we think is the Kingdom of Denmark, with an embassy sent from Spain um, by sea to the Danish islands. Um, it's a truly amazing story. Um, it's, it's in the book if you want to read it. The Arab ambassador is a remarkable man known as Al Ghazal, which means the gazelle, because he has such beautiful eyes. Um, and you have all his adventures on that. It's a really quite extraordinary piece of cultural encounter. Perhaps the most um, dramatic element of the Vikings in the Mediterranean was a three year expedition between 860 and 862. Um, which if you're a fan of the Vikings TV series, you might have um, recognized some of the names, perhaps led by Björn Ironside, who perhaps was one of the sons of Ragnar Lothbrok. Um, a, a, a truly um, almost mythological um, expedition that has left its impact in sagas and, and stories and, and mythology um, for centuries afterwards. It's the first Scandinavian passage of the Straits of Gibraltar, as far as we know, um, they raid in southern Spain, in the Balearic Islands, so wherever you've been on holiday to Ibiza or Mallorca or whatever, the Vikings got there first. Um, <laughs> they raided in Morocco, the Kingdom of Makur, and what is now the Moroccan Reef. Um, in Italy, in Tuscany, where there's a quite entertaining story that they thought they were attacking Rome. Um, we don't quite believe that, but it makes a good story. Um, and a, a truly extraordinary lost year in the eastern Mediterranean, where the fleet disappears from the historical record and only reappears when they start moving west again. And it's a, a scholarly game as to where it was they actually went. <laughs> some people think Byzantium, some people think Greece. Um, the one source that actually mentions the destination is an Arab text which says they go to Egypt. 
to Alexandria. And we might not think of Vikings in the delta of the Nile, but I think we should. Um, it, 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 it widens the Scandinavian world quite um, extraordinarily. And it ends when they return through the Straits of Gibraltar in 862, but this time their passage is blocked by uh, an Arab fleet, and they lose two thirds of their ships getting through. Um, and it's clear this, it, this becomes a, a sort of legend in the Viking world, spreading as far as Iceland. It's a bit like King, there are tales of these guys that come for centuries afterwards. And then by an extension of that, we get into the more familiar um, Eastern Mediterranean world, of the, the 10th and 11th centuries, the Varangians, Haro, Hardrada, and so on. And that brings us back to where I want to end this evening, because these are quite brief presentations just to introduce the book. It's something that you may have seen in Italy, you've probably seen its copies here in, in Athens, the Piraeus Lion, this enormous classical statue that used to stand in the harbour in Piraeus, was plundered by the Venetians um, in the early modern period and now stands outside the arsenal in, in Venice. But for a, a country that supposedly doesn't have um, Viking Age monuments, this is actually one of the biggest, most dramatic Viking Age monuments of all. Um, and that is why I think that it is the tip of the iceberg that Yemi mentioned. There, there must be a lot here. And for those of you who don't know what it is, that it's a, a huge marble lion dating probably to the 300s um, BCE, something like that, that's more than a thousand years later is, I was going to say graffitied, but uh, carved by Scandinavian mercenaries in very, very extensive inscriptions. This is not somebody scribbling on it. Um, they're, they're carving and chiseling, and it must have taken hours and hours and hours. And what that tells us is that those Scandinavians were basically in charge of the port of Athens because they couldn't have done it unless they were, which opens a little window onto whatever it was that was going on back then. You heard about the very exciting new collaborations coming out of Oslo um, with the initiative from Hawking Gloucester and the Viking Museum. I can also say that we've just been fortunate to be awarded um, some very extensive funding for a new center of the Viking Age in Uppsala. And just today I was talking to, to Yeni, who's on our advisory board, about a whole series of new collaborations in a very similar vein with the Swedish Institute as well. And I, I really hope that this is going to be the start of a pan-Nordic sort of collaboration on, on this, a new kind of aspect of, of the Greek past. So I'm going to end with um, the last line of the introduction to this book, which is quite simply that the Vikings in the Mediterranean are here to stay. <laughs> Any questions? Um, Professor Price. Uh, Professor Price is um, at the Department of uh, Archaeology and Ancient History, University of Uppsala. He's a professor there uh, of Archaeology and Ancient History. Thank you so much for this. Um, any questions? I would just like to ask you uh, if you could sketch a little bit the contents of the book, which means some choices uh, that happened or things that were. Oh, Marianne. Yes, well, Marianne. Thank you so much for that. Dr. <laughs> <laughs> Marianne Hemerickson, uh, Associate Professor uh, at the School of uh, Archaeology and Ancient History, University of Leicester. Thank you. Thanks so much. That was a very timely question that you had. Okay. Um, I am not going to give a blow by blow by every chapter of the book. We mm -hmm. hope that you will read the book. And something that hasn't been mentioned this evening is that the book will be open access and available for everyone within a few months, I think it is. So it will be possible to download um, for, for everyone who's interested. So we hope that you want to go home and read the book. Uh, as been said many times this evening, the, the Mediterranean is, is probably one of the most academically neglected regions uh, of the Viking diaspora. While we don't have vast amounts of evidence of Viking activity uh, across the Mediterranean, the archaeological and historical sources provide little glimpses into encounters among objects and bodies and languages and ideas that took place um, across the Mediterranean. And we only share just a few. 
So the book is divided into three themes or sections, um, and it begins with what we've called Iberian Reflections. So one example uh, of the research in the section of the book is a, a novel interrogation of the Arabic sources and maps of the broader Mediterranean areas, which reveals how the, norder, the northerners, when they were traveling as agents of trade or for military purposes, or perhaps for both, amassed significant knowledge specifically on the bodies of water in the Mediterranean areas, which were, of course, their main routes of transport, as well as knowledge of the geography and the geopolitical situation of these landscapes. And this knowledge could then be exploited, which they did to vary and degrees of success. Another fascinating little glimpse is a fantastic artifact, a Scandinavian-style box uh, from the Basilica of San Isidoro in, in northwestern Spain. The box is made of deer antler, uh, and it has been used as a reliquary. It has a very complex biography, and it tells a very tangible story of social relations within this one, uh, one object. So by examining the life history, we can gain glimpses of how an artifact decorated in a pre-Christian animal style may have ended up housing the bodily remains of St. Nicholas of Mira, and the box itself caught up in the political affairs of the Kingdom of Leon. Yet another Iberian reflection explores how landscapes of fortification and defensive structures, as we can actually see here on the image of the cover of the book, may also have been landscapes of anxiety, material manifestations of fear of incoming Viking pirates. And that fear was arguably also remembered in folklore for a really long time period afterwards. The second section of the book moves us to the Eastern connections. So we follow the careers of several of these famous Vikings and, and Varangians, exploring the logistics of their service and the varied influences that they brought back to the world. And then, as we've already heard, a few runic inscriptions written by these northern travelers exist in the Mediterranean and beyond. So, such as the Hagia Sophia, which we've heard from Sarko, perhaps as far east as the Black Sea, and of course the famous phrase, lion. However, there are also a number of runic inscriptions in the Scandinavian homelands that mention places like Greece and Jerusalem and Lombardia and Italy. And one of our authors argues that perhaps Viking warbands would have runic scribes with them on their journeys, functioning as storytellers as, as, and as memory keepers. Someone who could take the messages of poem and tell tales of great, great deeds, even if the warriors themselves did not return. And then the unintended consequences of a northern, northerner serving in the Byzantine army um, are also examined, including legacies of trauma and the experience of coming home to places that have moved on in their absence. As one of our authors, Ru Taylor, writes, uh, while not necessarily historical truth, some saga episodes in, uh, imply elements of trauma. Uh, and I quote, a soldier fighting in distant wars returns home and unable to leave the battlefield behind loses his way. And then finally, in the third and final section of the book, we uh, reflect on the complex, complex legacies and wider ramifications of Norse engagements uh, with the Mediterranean uh, in a section called Mediterranean Reflections. Uh, identity forms a major strand here. There are considerations of, of gender and warriorhood um, as articulated among the southern groups. The papers also disentangle complex material narratives that we've heard attached to objects such as the Perez Lion. And the authors in this section also consider issues of transmission and reception uh, as the Viking Age past has been adapted and represented from early modern times down to today's museum displays. So the papers assembled in this volume uh, are not the end. They constitute a starting point for a scholarly journey that will continue, encompassing camaraderie and exploration, violence and fear, unexpected meetings of languages, religions, objects and bodies. Um, a journey that significantly enriches our understanding of that complex time of Viking Age. And then last but not least, we also have some people we want to thank. Um, I wanted to say that the, the writing and the editorial work on this volume coincided with the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I remember specifically being on a very strict lockdown in the UK, sitting at my dining table, working through these chapters as they came in. 
many of our authors were homeschooling their children and teaching online, then I guess we all share that kind of general feeling of the world is, is ending. And yet we managed to do it, and the book is out, and we can again meet our friends and our colleagues and have fantastic events such as this book launch, for which I'm very grateful. We can develop new ideas and insights together. So we are, of course, most grateful to our authors who were patient with us, and in some cases we with them. Uh, and they delivered some fantastic articles uh, on one of the last blanks on the map of the Viking Age world. We want to thank our co-editor, co Kostin Janke, uh, who was mentioned earlier today, who unfortunately couldn't be here for all his hard work on the project. I wanted to thank Neil for inviting me along to the Scientific Advisory Board for the conference in the first place, and as co-editor. Uh, I don't know if this is a good time to admit that I actually know very, very little about Vikings in the Mediterranean, but, uh, <laughs> although I know not much more now than I did before, so thank you for that. Um, I want to uh, acknowledge the Viking Phenomenon Project that Neil directs, which was foundational in sponsoring and organizing the conference and supporting the publication, as well as the generous contribution from the Henry Oxel Nilsson Foundation. We very much want to thank the three Scandinavian institutes for all their uh, support and help with the conference and the book and for hosting us this evening. This is absolutely fantastic. And uh, we want to thank um, Pascalis, of course, who's overseeing the uh, completion of the book. Um, and then we really want to thank Zarko, who spoke earlier, formerly of the Norwegian Institute, who I believe had the original idea for this conference and, and expertly coordinated it in 2019. Many thanks to all. So the next step is to buy the book uh, <laughs> uh, and actually in Greece uh, it's available through Andromeda uh, bookstore, it's the archaeological uh, uh, bookstore in Mavromichali uh, in the center of uh, Athens. We don't sell it, we cannot sell books, yes. but uh, all our uh, publications go through this uh, channel. Thank you again for being with us. Uh, now it's time for a glass of uh, wine and some more chat about lighting and other. <laughs>